you guys can start playing something. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're so glad you guys are here today. Would you stand with us? We're going to get into some praise and worship here in just a moment. We're excited about being together today. I hope your week was great this past week. Hope you had a good week. And uh, I want to start off by reading uh, a scripture for us together here today. Uh, give me one second. Here we go. It's from Psalm 113. It says, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise his name. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and on the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home and makes her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Uh, I, I want to challenge you today as we enter into worship and as we're going to hear the word and we're going to encourage one another. I want to challenge you guys today to... Uh, to not let this just be another Sunday where we go through the motions and, and we come and we go and, you know, we, we had a great time. But let this be a day where we stir up our faith, where we stir up expectation. I, I'm, not, I'm not calling just for uh, your emotions to be stirred up. I'm not, I'm not calling for you to stir up the, the pain and the other stuff from this week. I want you to stir up your trust in God, that, that he is the God who who is seated on, on heaven, the one who lifts the poor up, and, he, and he's the one who can take people who feel like they're nothing, and he can seat them with princes. The one who can heal people and, and give them their deepest desires. Like, this is who God is. And so let's stir up our faith as we worship and as we sing. Let our faith, let our trust in God rise up from within us, shaking off everything that we came in here that wants to burden us down and weigh us down this week. Just shake it off and let's give God all the praise and honor. Amen. Father, we come before you and we invite you into this place. We ask you, King Jesus, to be with us, to stir us up, to shake us up, God, and to help us to see you and get a revelation of you today, God. We love you. And we give ourselves to you, and we give you all the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
So I run to the Father again and again, again and again. Oh, oh. You saw my condition at a play on the stone.
from Psalm 113 earlier, I felt like I had a 
uh, a, a word of knowledge from the Lord. In verse 9, it says, um, well, let me start let me back up in verse 7. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes. Verse 9, he gives the barren woman a home, making her a joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Now we can under that in the sense, we can, we can understand that in the sense of, you know, like when we went through our series with Ruth and Naomi, and we can understand it in that sense. Um, but I, I want to, I really felt like the Lord was saying that, um, that he gave me a word that there, there may be someone in here or even joining us online who you're, you've been struggling um, with, with getting pregnant, with fertility issues. And uh, I felt so strongly this morning when I read that psalm, and I felt it again um, when I read it here to open up our service. And um, I, I felt like the Lord wants to heal that. He wants to let you know he's got it in his hands. He sees you right where you're at. He understands you. He knows uh, the pain and the sorrow, and, and he's seen the expenses and everything that has gone into it, the long nights. Um, even the crying out, like, God, I've been praying for this for so long. Like, why? Like, I feel like you just aren't hearing me. God wants you to know today he, he has heard you. Um, and uh, in the Old Testament, King David has a son and he names him Solomon. But God shows up and he says, I'm, gonna, I'm going to have a son in this man. And I'm going to name him Jedediah, which means beloved of the Lord. It was a, it was a, a second name. He received just from the Lord, between him and the Lord. He never, he's never known by it anywhere else in the Bible. It's a name that the Lord called him to let him know, you're beloved by me. And I felt like, and this isn't saying I'm trying to pick out your baby names for you, but um, I felt like the, the name the Lord gave me was Rowan. And uh, Rowan, Rowan is a type of a tree that uh, produces red berries on it. And I felt like the word was fruitful meaning of the name meant fruitful. And so I, I don't know if that's you. If you want to talk afterwards, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. We're all going to pray for you in just a moment. Um, if you want to talk later, you want to message us later, and uh, let us know if that was you, and we can pray for you more specifically. We can do that. Um, but I, I felt the Lord wanted to encourage you. He sees you. He's heard your cry. He knows exactly what you're going through, and you can trust in him. And he's going to take what you thought was unfruitful and he's going to make it fruitful. He's going to give you fruitfulness and you're going to see it. And you're going to see a generation come because the Lord's faithful. And so uh, you're going to remember that with children and grandchildren that the Lord is faithful. And so could you just join with me? We want to we pray for that. I don't, I don't want to put anybody out there on the spot right now. Other times I, I do ask for you to kind of just step up and identify that as yourself. But right now... I just, want, I just want us to pray for whoever this may be. Father, we come before you right now in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that you see us in every moment, in good times, in hardships. And God, you're the, you're, you're the only consistent factor in our lives through the inconsistent seasons that we walk through. Lord, I thank you that in our pain, that, that even though you know how it's going to turn out, even though you know you want to give this person a child, um, Lord, that doesn't, your foreknowledge doesn't stop you from sitting with us and weeping with us and feeling our pain and being compassionate and empathetic. We thank you that you're a loving God like that, that even though you know everything and you know the joy that's going to come out of this situation, you don't tell us to just, hey, stop crying, dust yourself off, get over it, it's going to be okay, why don't you trust me? You actually sit with us in our grief. And I thank you that you're a God like that. There's no one else like you. And God, this is why we sing these songs. This is why we give you our worship. You alone are worthy, oh God. So, God, we honor you, and, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for provision of fruitfulness in this life, God. And we, we trust in you, God, to see this life come to pass and that your faithfulness would be known and that a new generation would be born completely out of your faithfulness and that it would be such a testimony for years and decades and generations to come, God. We, 
We thank you, God, and we trust in you. We give it all to you for your name, for your glory, God. Amen. 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 Can we sing again? I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I love to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. Thank you, Jesus. God, we surrender ourselves to you. We open our ears, we open our hearts and our minds for you to come and renew, to deepen, to strengthen, to refresh. And God, we surrender it to you for your way, God. We thank you, God, for the body of Christ, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, why don't you greet someone? Let them know you're happy to see them, and you can find your seat. Well, good morning, good morning. My name is E.J. Martone. I'm the lead pastor here at Genesis. If you don't know who I am, we're so glad that you're with us. We're so glad you're joining us online. Uh, all of our family that's watching from home, and maybe if you're a guest, we're grateful you're here today. Hey, can you guys give it up for our worship team? Man. I love, that was so sweet, so awesome, and and let's get, let's give a little bit of let's give a little bit of acknowledgement to Reese McConnell up there, leading us in first time leading the Genesis, loving it, did a fantastic job. We are so grateful for our team and for everybody who uh, makes these Sundays happen uh, when we can come together and we can worship together. It takes a team, and we got a great team. Uh, it takes a bunch of leaders, a bunch of volunteers. And uh, it, it always is a special time. So we love it. Uh, what we want to do right now is uh, we, we want to connect our giving to our worship here. And so uh, there, there's multiple, way to give, multiple ways to give. I did not sleep well last night. I am slurring my words all over the place. Um, help me, Jesus. There are multiple ways to give. They're up here on the screen. And uh, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. And, and can, I, can I just say, like last week... We brought up uh, the Reeds who were going to Nairobi on the missions field, and we asked you guys to show up and to bless them. You guys gave just around $1,000 to bless them. And so, man, the generosity and the blessing that that was that I saw come in um, was incredible. So thank you for that. And, uh, but, uh, but for those of you who also give in your tithes and offerings, again, thank you. Man, we reflect the nature and the heart of God when we are generous because he's been so generous to us. And uh, not just in giving of his one and only son, but, man, he gives us air to breathe every morning. He gives us the clothes on our back, the jobs, the, the strength to work. I mean, he, he's done so many good things for us. And when we give, that's an outflow of our worship to him. And so I just want to take a moment to pray. Um, so if you got a physical offering or if you're like me, you give online. If you want, I like doing symbolic things, so I hold my phone just as like my physical offering, something I can connect to um, when I pray. And I, I just want to take a moment and uh, let's just pray and thank God for what he's done as we give. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We bless your name, O oh God. And Lord, it is our honor and our pleasure to give back to you, God, just as, just as a way of saying thank you for providing, for protecting, for loving us, for your generosity towards us. And help us to be a generous people. Help us to continue to see needs and meet them, not just as a church, but even in our daily lives, God. Help us reflect your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're new with us, joining us for the first time today, we want to say welcome. Um, if you could do us a favor, we want to put a gift card in your hand uh, to Starbucks, free $5 Starbucks digital gift card. If you can text the word new, to the number up here on the screen um, and just fill out the short form. We will be able to send that out to you just as a thank you for being here with us today. We'll also be able to send you some info about the church and uh, give you a couple opportunities coming up where you can ask more questions and get to know who we are 
um, and figure out more about us, or even if you'd like to connect more. So we can do all of that as well, if you can uh, text that word to that number on the screen. Uh, one of the things that we value here at Genesis is community. And uh, community is so important. Uh, we, we talk about worship, honor, and community as our values, but community is, is just one of those things that we really love to emphasize a lot because as humans, especially living in our Western American culture, we, we, we are so predisposed to individuality and to going it alone and feeling alone, even when we're surrounded by people, that community is so important. And so part of our community is our life groups. It's when we do our events and come together. Um, but part of being the community is also serving. And so we talk in our household all the time about how, like, you know, there, there are certain things um, that we just do because we're a family. We love each other. We serve each other. We clean dishes for each other. We pick up toys for the little girls after each other. Like, we do, we do all of these things not because we have to or we're obligated to. We're a family. We, we, we've cho we are together, and we're choosing to love and serve one another. And so uh, we have, there, there's all sorts of ways to serve that is so important. It's part of our discipleship. It's how we grow in the Lord. It, it, it's, a, it's a constant discipline to humble ourselves and to live like Jesus, our servant king. And so there, there are always opportunities to serve and get connected here at Genesis. And so one of those ways... Um, that, that we can serve and, and a need that's happening right now um, is we need, we're about to get into this new school year. Wednesday nights are about to start back up uh, for our kids ministry. And so we need Wednesday night teachers. And so uh, we try to limit everyone who teaches to once a month because we understand life. And, uh, but, but we do need those teachers to be able to pour into these students, to love on them, to help them learn about Jesus practice the way of Jesus like we we start young and we want them to learn what what it means to love our enemies and what it means to believe in God and to trust him and so these are all such important ways and so uh, we have that real need for Wednesday nights and there are other needs as well and you can find those and sign up for those by texting the word community to 812-393-14 10. And so if you could do that, uh, if you think you can, you can meet a need here at the church, especially um, with the opportunity we have with Wednesday night kids teachers, we would really appreciate it if you could text us and let us know. Um, and we can, we can have more conversations with you about that. Last thing I want to announce real quick, next Sunday is the last Sunday of the month. We're super excited for it because it's Encounter. Our Encounter Prayer and Worship Night is going to be happening here at 6 p.m. We do have child care for nursery workers, and so we want to encourage everybody to show up and to get here um, for it. it. It's always a, a powerful time when we can come together and we set aside time with no real agenda just to pray and to worship, and it's very loose. Um, it, we have a great time. We have an MC who kind of oversees it all. Um, but uh, but it, it's just such a special time, and it's a great way to connect with the body, but also to hear from the Lord together as individuals through the word, through, through the gifts of the spirit that are in operation as we come together. It's really an awesome time, so I want to encourage you, if you have not come yet, to come. And if you have come, come again. So I want everybody to be able to show up, if you can, to next Sunday night. All right, that's all I got for you guys. I want to invite Darcy up. She's going to share the word this morning. Can you help me welcome her? Good morning. I'm going old school with a music stand today. It's a little more easy for me to manage. Um, so today is a great honor. Again, I always feel privileged and honor when I get to preach and get to share with you all. Um, and so if you want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, you can get that ready. I got to get all my stuff ready up here. Um, we are in this series, Becoming What You Worship, series. And talking about spiritual disciplines and what those look like. And so um, today I get to talk about um, things that can be destructive um, in our worship, divisive things in our worship. And I started to think about some things that, there's a lot of things. <laughs> there's, 
It's a whole lot. But um, I started to really think about when there is disunity in a church is what brings, I think, the most divisiveness in any congregation. And a church as a whole, not just a physical church, but church as a whole. When we talk about people being the church, um, this is what we're talking about. And so I started thinking about the beauty of unity and what that looks like. And I, and I was taken to Psalm 133, verse 1. We all know it, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Would you agree? Whether you're in a family, when I'm in unity with my family, my kids, we're all like jiving, we're great, nobody's fighting, everybody's getting along, people are picking up those toys EJ talked about, all those things. It's like you look around, if you're a parent, you're like, I absolutely love my family. And you're like, they are just the best. Wow, what an awesome thing. Because that's what unity does. It lets you see the beauty of the people that you are doing life with. When there's destructive things, when there's divisive things, when there's arguing, complaining, grumbling, all those things, then you start to say, huh, we have a lot of work to do. And all of a sudden, you start to see all the fleshy things that you're like, God, are you sure I'm equipped to handle this all? Are you sure you should have trusted me with all these little humans right now? And, and God says yes. Of course he says yes. So we're talking about unity. So how does unity happen in a church? We talk about it a lot and we hear that it's important, but how does it happen for the church as a whole? But also for our church, for Genesis Church. Look around. Look around. Everybody look around. Look around. Say hey to somebody. Um, so we often hear about it, but how do... How are we actually called to participate in it? And that is something that we are actually all called to do. So being a church is not a spectator sport. Sorry, if you like to just go to a baseball game and get all the concessions, church is not like that. Church is rather an activity where all around, everybody in the congregation needs to actually participate. We're actually on the field. You might be the first baseman. You might be the outfield. You might be the, like, the dugout mom, you know, I like, they, I, I know, I looked at Brianna because she was my son's coach, and like, you need a dugout mom, um, and so these things matter, so talking about the beauty of unity, why relationships in the family of God actually do matter, because if not, it causes division, so, and then when it causes division, it ultimately disrupts worship, genuine worship, not just coming and singing lyrical songs, but an attitude of worship, a lifestyle of worship. So that's what we're going to talk about. And so I, you know, it's easier when you preach exegetically, which means like verse by verse, chapter, verse, like through the Bible, because then you just kind of follow the breadcrumbs. It's a lot harder whenever you're talking about topics. And I started to get a little nervous, like, what, what, where do I go? How do I communicate the feelings that I'm starting to feel for this sermon? And so God directed me to First Peter chapter 2. Because I don't think that we can achieve unity without remembering that, one, we're to continually grow as Christians. And, two, that we're called to be living stones, that we're active, alive members of the body of Christ. And that, three, that we're called to be the light of the world for all to see. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm sorry, I have to apologize. You have no slides today. Um, it wasn't because the slides aren't working. It's because I didn't do them. So this is a moment of grace that you can extend to me right now. So if you're a visual learner, I'm so sorry. Um, so read with me in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. And it says this. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. I could literally just end right there. That is a lot to not do, and it's all hard things not to do, right? To, all those things, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. But it continues to say, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture, it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. 
Now to those who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Amen. It's like, go Peter. Peter just like, I love Peter. Peter is one of my favorites. He is just holds no bar. He just is so honest. And, I mean, if you like the chosen at all, then you definitely love Peter um, because he's just a favorite. Um, so, let, hold on. Let me get situated up here. I actually probably need that bigger pulpit because you have more room for all these notes. Um, so, hold on. Sorry. I need that later. Um, so, first one. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Peter is pointing back into his letter to verse chapter 1, speaking to those who have believed in God and put their faith and hope in God. He is saying to these Christians, you used to be a certain way, but you have turned from these pagan ways, and you have a new life. You have been baptized, and you have now declared a new life. So I'm holding you to a different standard, basically, is what Peter's saying. You might not be what you used to be, but now, Game on. You now have belonged to Jesus. And now there's a different standard. There's a higher calling. You have to act differently to these Christians. And that is good for all of us to remember. So in chapter, or verse 2, it says, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Peter is telling, these are young Christians that he's talking to. He's telling them to crave what is pure. Don't be confused by what has happened, the deceitfulness of your past. But he's saying spiritual milk is what you need. And spiritual milk is the logos word of God. So a better translation would be to crave the unadulterated spiritual milk of the word of God. So devotional books are great. I have a million of them. I love devotional books. Um, doing you version devotions are great. But there's nothing, nothing quite like the unadulterated word of God. Amen. This is what's going to feed your very spirit. When you don't know what to do, when you're trying to figure out stuff, don't go looking in all these different places. Get your spiritual life fed. And all of a sudden, you're going to start to grow. You're going to start to see things differently. You're going to start to have revelation from God. Because it's not just for people who are called to vocational ministry to hear the voice of God. It's for everybody. Every single person that's part of the church of God, they are also called to hear the word of God. Whew, I'm preaching. <laughs> but I need a drink. <laughs> I'm a hot mess today. I'm just not going to lie. It's just, it's true. I am. So you get me in all my glory. <laughs> so this is who he's talking to. And so the Christian life should not just be, I got saved and salvation. That's, a, that's the pivotal point of change. But the Christian life is the continual nourishment of the word. It should, you should be marked by your growth, not just by your salvation. So I love this picture. I have a lot of babies. I was a nanny before I was a mom. And so I have watched a lot of babies go from bottles, from being breastfed, to getting their first bite of real food. And that is such a fun thing. Anybody else agree? I, like, documented every single one of them. They have probably 100 pictures for that first moment of first bite of food. And so um, I, I think it's so fun. And I think about Lincoln. He's our second born. He's 11. Um, we did pretty good not giving our kids chocolate or sweets. Jovi's a whole different case, guys, okay? She's the sixth born. She doesn't qualify for the rest of my parenting skills. But we did really well with, like, not giving them all those sweets until their first birthday. 
and I would make them a smash cake, and you know, they would love it. Hudson hated it. He wouldn't even put his face in it. I'm like making him dig his hand in, and he didn't like being messy. But Lincoln, Lincoln loved it. Um, so we all sang happy birthday to him. He has like 40 people surrounding him, and he takes the first lick of icing, and he went, mmm. <laughs> then, I kid you not, I am not exaggerating, 35 minutes long, if not longer, mmm. Mmm, and he was just tasting the icing. Mmm, like, like his expression changed every time. Finally, he got to the good chocolate cake, and it was homemade, and it was delicious, and it was like, Mm, he tasted how good it really was. And so Peter is reminding them that you have tasted the goodness of God, his grace. And once you have tasted it, mm, right, you can't go back. You don't go back to not wanting sweets ever again. Maybe if you are, I mean, you're rare. You're a unicorn. But maybe he's talking to them. He's reminding them that, like, you have tasted this goodness, the graciousness of who God is. And so you should have this continual appetite to desire the spiritual food that you have tasted and seen because God is good. So the next chapter, or I keep saying chapter, the next verses, 4 through 8, talk about, um, they highlight what it is about the rock or the stone. So I'm going to read through them again. It's important that we note that this imagery was used throughout all scripture, um, that people understood the importance of having a cornerstone or rocks because that was the culture that they were. They were masons. They understood those type of things. So the presence of God is not just a place, but it's an indwelling among believers. And so the imagery is really beautiful. It says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. So who's him? Jesus. He has shown that he has the stability of being the risen savior. God raised him from the grave. He isn't dead. He's surely alive. He put his stamp of approval on him that he is my chosen one. He has been rejected by men, nailed to a cross. But I tell you, God saying to you that he is the living stone. He's alive today. He's not just a stone that came and just a wonderful prophet that graced us with his presence on this earth, but he is surely alive. I could, I was like, while I was writing the sermon, I'm like, I could literally sing my way through this sermon with all the songs, like, God's not dead, he's surely alive, he's living on the inside. So, um, yeah. Anyways, so verse 5, you also, like living st stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And I want to focus on this for a minute. We are added to a new priesthood. It's not just reserved anymore for this eliteness in the culture that they're living. Instead, um, it is available for everyone who identifies with Christ. We have immediate access to God. Where before, they didn't have immediate access. If I am driving in the pickup lane at school, I have access to God. While I'm in Aldi, I have access to God. While I'm at a stoplight, I have access to God. While I'm making dinner, I have access to God. I don't have to be in church to have access to God. Aren't you thankful for that? I am because I am so glad that whenever my soul and my spirit needs to cry out to the living God, my soul gets the opportunity to have complete access to the throne room of Jesus. God is accessible. And our worship and our lifestyle is our daily sacrifice. It's our spiritual sacrifice. So we serve God personally, but also as a church we serve God. So Peter then points to us, those who identify with Christ, that he's saying we are also then living stones. So in verse 6, um, or that's what he said, you are like living stones being built into spiritual houses to be holy priesthood. So verse 6, for in scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Isaiah 28, 16 is what's being referenced here. Isn't the Bible so filled with such little nuggets of coolness when you actually see how it all connects? That it's not just a cool little scripture that is being talked about. He's, he's talking and, and quoting Isaiah who people knew. If you studied the scriptures, if you study as a Jewish person, person, then you knew the scriptures, and you knew exactly what he was talking about. And so when they built the temple, 
there was a carefully chosen cornerstone that was chosen to build the entire structure around. So this is why when we sing on Christ alone, my hope is found, right? He is the cornerstone. We place our, our faith and our trust on Jesus, the chief cornerstone. That's a name of God because why? Because we know that he is unshakable. He's immovable. He's not changing. We may change, but he never does. And so we do this because he is worthy to put our foundation on. It's a beautiful prophetic image that Jesus is the one that we trust and put our hope in. So it continues to say, now to those who believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. It's a joy and an honor to be in unity with Christ. That's our joy. It's not a duty. It's, it's an honor to get to, to identify with him. And those who reject him, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's a harder life, I think. So continuing on, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they are destined for. When we think about when a new believer comes to Jesus, the image that is that we're like stones being added to a spiritual house. So we're being built. So when EJ gave his heart to God, a stone was added. When Beth gave her heart to the Lord, a stone was added. Dave, Jeremy, like we can keep going that we were added and we are being surrounded by the chief we're being based on the chief cornerstone. He's our rock. But we are also the living stones. We are also now the church. We represent him in everything we say and do. Our lifestyle reflects the God that we serve. So I think it's really cool that Peter, who is the author of all this, was also the one spoken to in Matthew chapter 16. You know it. It's so good. It's such a good moment in church history. So when Peter declared, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That word living again, it's proclaiming. He's not dead. He's a living God. Jesus was still there. He didn't even die yet. So how does he know? And Jesus replied to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For that was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Peter was actually renamed in this moment. EJ kind of talked about a little bit. And about being renamed by Jesus. When God gives you a name. So he starts it off by saying, good answer, Simon, son of Jonah. Gold star. <laughs> But then he continues to say, this revelation is so good and so deep. And Peter, now your name's Peter. And Peter means rock or stone. That's the meaning of Peter. So I think it's just like one of these side note moments. So um, our kids, Titus, is middle name is Stone. I don't know if you guys knew that. But um, we named him Titus Stone because we felt that this baby would be used to build up the church on the foundation of Christ. That he would be used in the body of Christ specifically for churches. And it's so funny. Hold on. Titus is turning eight, like, next week. Um, and ever since he's been very little, he's always loved the name Peter. I mean, if you are playing make-believe with him, you're like, what's your name? And he's like, Peter. If he gets a dog someday, Peter. Um, every stuffed animal... Peter the bear. We took him to build a bear, and it's Peter the bear. Peter, 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 Peter. Because you know why? When God gives you a name, it's so innately in you. Because it's given by the spirit of the living God. His name is Titus Stone. Yes, we prophetically, I feel like, named him. And little does he know. His prophetic meaning of his name, he's only eight. But, man, he knows that he is Peter. I mean, if you ask him today, do you, would you change your name? He would probably say, yeah to Peter. I mean, he loves Peter more than Titus, so let's pray on that a little bit. But I think it's so neat that from this, like, so Peter gets his whole name changed because he is, Jesus is declaring to him, you're going to build my church, Peter. You are understanding the philosophy, what no man can ever comprehend, what's never been done in history before, because now you're going to have the living God amongst you. And so he's saying, Peter, you got to, like, you get it. You understand this theology. Peter might have been a little rogue, but he was smart too. And so um, verse 9, let's keep, 
get back into it. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And the other verses continue to go on. Like in verse 12, it says, list such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day that he visits us. I'm getting to the whole unity thing, but I wanted to set the stage. In Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16, it says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. The Bible is filled with analogies and images that people can relate to. So in the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Philippians 1, 27 says, whatever happens, whatever happens, good or bad, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in the absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospels. Church, we need to conduct ourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. What gospel are we talking about? We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one that has come and changed all of our lives for the better. Would you agree? And so when we say that we are now representing Jesus, when we tell people that we're a Christian, that they know that you're a Christian, we better be different. We have to be. Because we're not just representing ourselves any longer. There's individuality in the kingdom of God, obviously. But when we're conducting ourselves, how we handle ourselves, we represent not just a church. We're not just Genesis Church, but we're representing the church, the church that's built on the chief cornerstone, the one that is the one who has come and changed all of our lives. So we are not just to be an island to ourselves either. Um, I think that a lot of times people can say, I'm kind of done with the church, but, you know, I love Jesus. I don't like that. (laughs) I'll be honest. I don't really like when people say that because that's not how the kingdom of God is set up. It's not an individualistic game. It is. You have your place to have your personal walk with the Lord. But we're also called to be a community, to be relational with one another, to do life with one another. And so... Um, why is that? Why are we called to do that? It's so that we can shine brightly, so that we can worship freely, so that people can see that there's a difference in how they handle the hardships. There's difference in how they handle their joy. There's difference how they talk to each other. There's a difference because then we don't get the glory. God gets the glory. It reflects back to Jesus when we shine brightly When we become a chosen people, like in verse 9, a royal priesthood, it's not just so that we can have pride and arrogance and be like, I got access to God. I'm so sorry about your life. If you had what I had, it's so demeaning and it's so down and it's just not very positive. But instead, it says so that you, we get this honor and the privilege so that we may declare the praises of him who called you. Remind yourself that you've been called out of darkness into a marvelous light, a wonderful light. So the Christian life is not to be done just alone. But God calls us to be together, to be a family, to serve one another, to be authentic. That can be hard. Genuine and real. So that there's beauty in our vulnerability and gives God the credit for the work that he can do and that he will do if we let him in our lives. So I really believe that there's always been um, an emphasis on the me-centric idea in our culture. Would you guys agree with me that we're living in a day and age where my needs should be met first before I even extend any help to anybody else? that my family should be taken care of, that um, I don't want to overdo myself, I need to think about my mental health. All these things are good when they're in balance. When they're out of balance, they can cause a lot of discord. And it can infiltrate into the church life as well. So um, we're not called to live according to worldly standards, right? We're called to live according to the spirit. 
and to live with a biblical perspective. So the church needs to be something completely different. And this includes how we handle our differences. Um, it needs to be different, how we function as one body with many different personalities, many different strengths and weaknesses, many different opinions. So how can we have unity but yet contain the individualistic that God has created us uniquely with? Because would you agree God has created us all unique? There's people, if you're an extrovert, I'll start with you. Let's see you, extroverts, wave your hand at me. Extroverts, I expect more from you right now. Hi, extroverts. Okay, the introverts, you could just give me a finger because I know that's like a lot. Okay, I see you introverts. Um, there's some people who love to say it just, I'm going to keep it real and tell it like it is kind of folks. I'm one of those. I, I think I'm looking at you, Michelle. You're with me there. Um, okay, some who are like better to just, I'll just have my opinion and never share it with anybody. Where are you? Nobody's confessing. Okay, thank you, Casey. Thank you. I know, because this is like goes against every bit of your body right now. I get that. Because God has called us all to still be in unity together. So how do we take all these differences and filter it to function as one family? I don't know about you. I got a big family. I'm one of five. Um, most of us are married. There's 25 grandkids. When we all get together, we are not always dwelling together in perfect harmony. Because all of a sudden... I'm going to let that person stay up when I'm putting my kids the same age to bed or this or that or whatever. And we all get along, like, really well, um, considering that there's, like, 30-plus people living in one house at a time. But there's differences that come to play. The parenting differences, the lifestyle differences, all those things come to play. But we love each other. We choose to love each other. We, we choose to hear each other, to respect each other's opinions, to say, hey, I'm going to be putting my kid to bed. If you want to keep yours up, that's fine. No judgment, right? Because we love each other and we care about each other and we want to have relationship together. None of us live close to each other, so when we're all together, we want to desperately make it work because we're a family, and that's what families do. We, as a church, are a family, so that's what we have to do. The differences are going to come to play a little bit. So what causes divisiveness in a church? And I have to do a huge, big, bold disclaimer, like shining light disclaimer. I'm not talking about anybody individually. I am not even talking about any circumstances that I might have encountered with any of you. So please do not take offense if you hear any of these things that are listed under the divisiveness charts. Take it up with the Holy Spirit because he's the one that revealed these things to me. Please keep your hands and feet inside the vehicle at all times. <laughs> That's what it just sounded like. But I want to say that because I know that whenever somebody's speaking sometimes and it's about negative things, you can be like, oh, I why would she say that? Like, how dare she say that about me? I'm not saying it about you, I promise. If it is about you, I'm the one who tells it like it is, and I'll tell you I'm talking about you. But anyway, so here are some things that I believe cause divisiveness in the family of God, the church. First one, under the category, coming in strong, is preferences. Preferences. Worship style. I think we should only do three songs. I think that too many fast songs is just too many. Maybe we need a little bit more extended worship time. Maybe we need some altar time. I don't know. Maybe we should have the same worship leader every single week. Maybe we shouldn't. Worship style, preferences, teaching style. EJ is the lead pastor of this church. He should be preaching more. Than, why is Darcy talking right now? He should be preaching right now. I don't know if women should be preaching in ministry. Um, wrong church. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, all these different teaching styles. I like when we go exegetically. No, I like topical. No, I prefer, do you hear that word? I prefer, it's a preference, money. Mm, this is why I was like, God, do I really have to talk about this one? Money, how it's dealt with. Why do pastors get paid? Why are we supporting children going to camp? Why are we doing this? Why I tithe? I should have a say-so in what the money goes to. I don't like that outreach idea. I don't want to put my money towards that. Money, divisiveness, critical spirit. When you have a critical spirit, it causes divisiveness in a church. I know this so wholeheartedly that in any union that you're in, family, workspace, whatever union of when you have to be relational with people, place, 
When there's a critical spirit, it breeds negativity. It breeds that you're complaining and you're grumbling. And why do they do that? Why do that? Oh, well, if I was in charge, we've heard that before. So preferences, that's category number one. And you can add more things in there. That's just some of the things. Two, consumerism. We talked about this a little bit before. A focus on being individual rather than unified and whole. Um, how we serve, how we view a Sunday morning, how other activities at the church. It can be sometimes a me culture. Are my needs being met? Um, do I get what I want out of whenever I'm asked to do that? It's an entertain me kind of attitude. Um, so consumerism can come and it can look like when you walk into a church and you're not participating in the serving of the church. There could be a lot of quickness of that, it becomes about you, because you forget that other people are serving. And I could do a whole sermon on consumerism, how it's affected the church as a whole. I'm very passionate about it, so if you would ever like to come have chai tea around my table, I would be happy to have you, because I believe it's one of the biggest things that's destroying the church. I really do. I, when you look about and whenever, you know, I think about when my parents went to church, why the church was so important to them, why they valued it. It's because they weren't in such a consumeristic mindset as we are in the culture that we live in today. The church matters because this is who we, who God, if you choose Genesis, if you're visiting, I'm so sorry. But if you choose Genesis as your home church, then you're part of this. You're part of us. You have to do life with people. You might not even like everybody, but you have to do all of that because we're a church and we have to work and operate together. So consumerism. Are my needs met? Um, division. So division, can. some of the things I added under there were conflict. Um, how we handle conflict, because that brings division. Um, it split churches over, dis over conflict, right? Like, I think that conflict's a big one. The silent killers, I like to call them. Uh, things that just kind of sit and fester for a long while, and then all of a sudden, somebody's, like, not here, and you're like, what happened? I have no idea, because something just festers and never was talked about and never dealt with. Gossip. Gossip's a big one. Slander. Lack of prayer. Um, just being a da, 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 go, 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 and forgetting to actually be people of prayer. These things can cause division. So other, um, this quote, I just read this last night, actually, and so I thought it was so good. It says, divisions in the church always, so an absolute statement there, always breed atheism in the world. Ouch. People should know us by our what? What was that? By our love. But I think that people know more what we're against, who we're mad at, more than how we love and what we stand for. They forget that we serve a God who's filled with mercy and grace and kindness because I don't think we're filled with mercy, grace, and kindness. It expires rather quickly, especially in church world. There's more grace and love extended to your neighbor that you might just talk to occasionally than the people that you're in life group with. So other things that cause divisiveness. Unhealthy, extreme, polar opposite. So shut up, like, and just don't deal with it. Like, I'm fine, I'll just, I'm fine. I, I don't need to talk about it. Or the people who go to the complete opposite and want to talk about every single thing under the sun. And then it's just like lots of talk. So extreme opposites. Uh, people who only pray. No, we need more time in prayer. More prayer, more prayer, more prayer. But then the op complete opposite is, no, we are doers. So the Martha, Mary opposites that conflict with each other, everything needs to be in balance. So um, words over worship or worship over the word. I prefer a longer worship set. No, I think we should give more time to the word. Divisiveness, because both are equally important. Criticism without relationships. This one, I think, causes a lot of divisiveness. A lot of people... Um, especially if you've ever worked with students and children, um, we really believe in this, that relationships matter. If I want to talk pretty point blank to somebody, that I need to have relationship with them so that that instruction, criticism, whatever you want to call it, can be received. So if you're doing life with somebody and you know them outside of just spiritual things, you can have a lot more voice into their life. So when um, I just heard this too, I think it was Tom Holland who said it, 
and so I might butcher it, so sorry, Tom Holland, but um, he was talking about Christian Bale, actually, and he was talking about how he was giving him advice that, um, oh gosh, how does it go? If somebody has a problem with me, they should call me, and if they don't have my number, they shouldn't have a problem with me. Go Tom Holland. He's preaching in his interviews. Go ahead, Spider-Man. So I, I was like, wow, that is so good because it shows relationships matter. If you don't even have my phone number, I don't know how well you know me to know how much to criticize me, right? Or to have these strong opinions about X, Y, or Z. So relationships really can filter that. Um, perfectionism. I think that's divisive in a church. Not being real. Whenever you put on display that your life is just wonderful and God is good all the time, amen, and you never actually confess to somebody, listen, this week was hard, or, you know, that perfectionist mindset, and you get worried that, well, what, what are they going to think about me? I'm not perfect enough. I struggle with that for a lot of my life. I understand that so well, and it's probably why I err on the side of being too real now, guys, so I'm trying to come back in, in balance, but perfectionism equals not real. Lack of being vulnerable. And then the last one I wrote down is inaction. We're the first to pray and the last to act, or the first to act and last to pray. So an action can really cause a lot of division um, because you could pray, 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 pray about something when there's other people doing, 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 and then the people who are doing, 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 doing get frustrated that the people who are praying, 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 praying. And do you see how that can be divisive? It becomes, it can breed a critical spirit. Why aren't they praying more? Why aren't they serving more? And it's just like this, like, tick, 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 tick. And it gets hard to navigate those relationships. So relationships will be broken because all these things are real things. So relationships will break in a community of a church. It's going to happen. Relationships are broken because there isn't as much genuine and authentic and vulnerableness and that realness in our dealings with one another. I'm taking my ball and going home. That kind of mentality doesn't heal anything. So when you walk into Walmart and see that person, you feel it in your spirit, don't you? Whenever you, you have had conflict with somebody and hasn't been resolved, you're like, okay, this is weird. I don't even know how to approach you. You're so mad that I don't even think I could apologize if I wanted to because it wasn't dealt with in health. So, um, the picture that kind of came to mind, so you're going to have to use your visualness today, is the Kintsune vases. It's uh, these beautiful vases that are, I think, of the Japanese culture. Um, they are pots or pottery that's broken, and when they're broken, they're, they're restored with beautiful gold um, in all the crevices and cracks, and it makes these beautiful pieces of art. And do you know that there's actually a real philosophy behind them? They do it on purpose, too. It's not just, oh, oops, if, if something happened. It's, they do it on purpose to show that when we are faced with adversity, we can turn the situation around if we take care of it with patience, with love, and understanding. Isn't that really pretty? I kind of want one of those vases now because I think it's so, I'm very visual, and I think that picture is just so beautiful to think that whenever something comes, when these diversities happen and when these differences happen, um, how we handle them, if we handle them properly, they can be turned into wonderful works of broken pieces. We're all broken. We're relational people, and we're all going to break relationships at one point or another. But we do it so that God can be glorified to say, hey, yeah, we used to not get along, but we talked it out and we worked it out because we love Jesus as our chief cornerstone. Our lives revolve around him, so therefore we're not going to let things fester. We're not going to let things happen because God could take it and to turn it into something beautiful. And so that's where it makes us these living stones because we're, we're alive and we're moving and we're breathing and we're being built into spiritual houses, the Bible tells us, to be a holy priesthood offering these spiritual sacrifices to God through our lives. So we talked about some negatives, and I wanted to talk about some positives of the church. I know I'm running out of time, I think. Bear with me for a minute. So let's talk about the beauty of the church. Those that serve. I think it's awesome, the people that serve our church. We have such a good database of volunteers. Um, the worship team, they're here 
early, every single Sunday. Somebody's here making coffee so that, how many enjoyed a cup of coffee on your way in today? Because somebody made that cup of coffee for you. They came early. They put their preferences aside of sleeping in so that they, you could have some coffee. The volunteers downstairs with kids, they sacrificed to be in service, to be available. Um, I love that there's other adults in my life as I'm raising six kids that they have adults who speak into their lives on a Sunday morning. Especially as pastors, can I tell you how crucial that is for my children? That they see other men and women who love Jesus with their whole hearts. That it's not just me telling them to come and serve, but to be shown to be served first as a child. I actually brought this. See, I told you I was going to use this. Do you see this? This is Jovi. And um, she actually did it with painted nails, if you can see that. I was really impressed. She's three. Um, and I was looking at this this past week because I overheard her coming to tell Daddy, Daddy, look, I help Jesus. I'm his hands. She's three. I'm his helping hands. I help Jesus. And he's like, yes, you do. And so then the whole week, if you think, if you're a little arrows teacher, that your lessons are not being commuted well, let me tell, or computed well, they are. Because in the whole week, she said, Mommy, I'm a helper. I help Jesus. Can I stir the eggs? Yes, you can, Joby. Can I get the copies off the copier? Yes, you can, Joby. Why? Because somebody taught her that she's the helping hands of Jesus. It might not seem like a big deal, but to a three-year-old, I think that's a really big deal. Do, do you agree? So I'm thankful for you teachers. I'm thankful for the people who decide to sacrifice being in service every week to serve. Because that's something to worth celebrating, even with her painted nails. Life groups. Life groups are awesome because it's iron sharpening iron. You're doing life together. I think about the recent funeral with Greg Bryles and uh, mom when he, when we called upon the church. So much food, too much food, right, Greg? Because you all showed up. That's a positive. That's worth celebrating. When I think about our lawnmower breaking and we called and like EJ posted it and Jerry Polly showed up to get our riding mower to where it needs to be fixed because you're doing life together. So I think about these things and why it matters because relationships, I'm going to just keep saying it. They matter. They matter. When my dad passed away a year and a half ago, um, it was like two weeks before Thanksgiving. And he was supposed to come for their first trip here to Indiana to visit us for Thanksgiving. So it, it took a really hard pain and made it even magnified because we already had like the beds made up. You know what I mean? It's like things were already in the works to host them. And I had shared with somebody about just they were asking how they could pray. And I said, you can just pray because like it's going to be hard for my kids because they were he was supposed to be here. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> and, um, and I told her that my dad always brought donuts. It was like his thing. He would always go out early in the morning because he's an early riser. Like, I'm not. And he would always bring donuts into our kids, right, like every time he visited. So it was just like a side comment. And then on Thanksgiving morning, somebody dropped donuts for my kids with a note. That's being the church, and that's worth celebrating because relationships and having those conversations and saying, this is going to be so hard. And somebody saying, I hear you, and not just I'm going to pray for you, but being filled with action and love to say, I care about those kids, and I care about you. I don't even love donuts. I'm very picky about my donuts. <laughs> but that moment mattered so much because then immediately it's like if you're watching like do 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 like relationship might have been here and all of a sudden it's like do 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 like it's filled up because all of a sudden my kids knew they care about me they 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 care about my needs so relationships matter we don't say this to to be part of all the program esque things of the church um, it's because when you serve together, when you grow together, when you do life together, you get to know people. Stuffing Easter eggs, I got to know so many people I didn't know before, and we're stuffing Easter eggs for the warehouse, right? Because you're talking, you're laughing, you're cracking jokes, you're making fun of each other. It's glorious, and it bonds you, and it binds you together. And then when conflict arises, because it will, then there's relationship that backs up 
the conflict. I know them. I, I, I've hung out with them. I'm doing life with them. You can handle it better. So when we allow divisiveness to creep in, we allow a derailment of the unity. We're no longer discarding broken things like, oh, I don't like you anymore. No, we're going to say, I do like you, and we got to figure out this how to do life together moment. So, like, when I think about when I gave my heart to Jesus, like, all in. Like, I always loved Jesus ever since I was a little girl. I gave my heart to him at four. But then when we were at 12, God started to really make me own my faith, and I knew it. And he was calling me to so many different things. And I wanted God, I didn't know it was called divisive ways, but I knew I wanted God to start to change the things I knew weren't pleasing to him. So, some of those things was that I was a really good people pleaser. I, I was, yes, I will help you. Yes, I will do this. Yes, I can be there. All these things. I volunteered a lot at 12. Um, pretty amazing. Shout out to my 12-year-old. You volunteer a lot too. But I was lots of people pleasing. I was good at lying. Um, not like bold face lying, but manipulation. You know, like, oh, I could work the crowds and I could... Um, if with this person I could be this way and over here I could be that way and with my friends who love Jesus I was that way and the friends who didn't I could still hang. I wasn't bad but I could still hang and I started to know that God wanted to uproot that and I started to see that it was all these negatives that, that were part of the beautiful traits that God had given me. Um, John Mark Comer says we're to deny ourself not ourselves. I'm going to say that again. We are to deny ourself not ourselves. And what that means is that we are called to, to put away fleshly things. Not that we give up being, you know, having boundaries and the different things that keep our health alive. Because there's, there's also like pain in overly doing. But it's about saying, I'm, I'm going to die to myself. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but you, it's Christ who lives inside of me. Paul didn't cru get crucified. It's our flesh. So when we die to our flesh, we truly live. And so I realized that the devil comes and he twists the things that can be used for good. The things that God uniquely put inside of me, he wants to use to make me a living stone for him. So like my gifts, my talents, my personality, my strengths, the humility and my weaknesses, all those things when submitted to Jesus can be used for good. And I think we tend to think, like, the devil is, like, really, like, nasty, like, da 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 da, -da like, kind of like this picturesque of the devil. He's gross and nasty. But we forget that he was the angel of light, and he uses deception and lies. That's all he has to do. He doesn't have to make you completely deny Jesus. He just needs you to live according to your flesh so that you will start to doubt the good things that God has put inside of you so that it will naturally derail you from your faith. It's just a little ounce of doubt. Looking back at my fleshy ways, ooh, I should have do this better. I should have this more. My flesh speaks, and all of a sudden it makes me get mad at the things he has given me. So instead now, with all those negative things, I saw that the devil was twisting to use in my personality, being submitted to Jesus, I can be genuine and real and vulnerable with you as honestly as I can. And that I want to be friends with all, not just because I would like you all, but because the fear is out that I'm going to miss out on something. That fear is put to rest because now I serve God and, and you, you get what you get with me and, and that is why. Because I don't want to be disingenuine. I want to be honest so that my life, when I tell you it's been a rough week, or yes, this or whatever happened, you could say, wow, she, she serves God through all of that or whatever. I, I'm not put together. I don't have it all together. My house is always messy. I talk about that a lot. It is. Right now it's really clean, so maybe we should have you all over now. But, like, so, like, when things like that happen, it's the fear of that perfectionism I talked about before and not being honest with people that can be honest in my family. Your family sees you at your best and worst. So we need to be these broken vessels, raw and honest and pure about our pain and allowing Jesus to come and fill those cracks to show that people that, like, yeah, relationships are hard, but look what God can do in and through us with his grace. He can change it. He can make it something beautiful. Worship, worship isn't just pretty lyrical songs that we sing. It's a lifestyle that we are becoming these living stones that form this spiritual house to point people to Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 3, 2 through 3, if, um, Reese, if you can come on up. It says, you yourselves are a letter written on our hearts, 
known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. There it is again, the living God. It's proclaiming who he is. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. We are letters, epistles, living epistles, the Bible calls us, for all to read. Somebody might not pick up the Bible. God's sovereign, Holy Spirit's sovereign enough to have that happen. They might not pick up the Bible, but they are watching your life. They're watching how you interact with other people. You say, I'm a Christian. They watch. Are they a Christian? Are they really? Are they really who they say they are? There's this, like, deconstruction of faith that's happening um, in this culture um, where people are walking away from the church, rightfully so sometimes, sadly, where they want to deconstruct their faith and they, I've had conversations with people who say, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. I'll never go back. Why? And when you can sit and be humble and listen to the reasons why, it should sadden your heart because people represent Jesus so terribly so awfully like why would I want to serve a God who makes you like that kind of way and I do believe that deconstructing faith can be healthy I also heard this quote actually from Luke this past week and I was like I'm going to use that in my sermon because it's so good um, and it said something along the lines that what if the deconstructive movement is the revival that you've all been praying for That hit me like a ton of bricks because I want our lives to not just be traditional and religious, to go through the motions, to check it off our list, but I want to grow and build upon the faith that I'm so blessed that I was given at a young age. I want my kids to know Jesus in an even more healthy manner than I do. And deconstruction is good. Everybody listen up to this. Deconstruction is good as long as you rebuild it. You can't throw everything away and say, I tried it. The church needs to represent Jesus a little bit better. And so if you're like, how is this going to play into all these spiritual disciplines? I'm going to get to that in just a second. But there's this song. I don't think it's the one that you're playing, so sorry. But um, that's pretty popular right now. It's called Make Room. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. And the bridge of that song says, shake up the ground. Break down the walls of all my religion. I love organized church. I'm part of it. I work for the church. I love the church. I will always love the church. But there's things I don't even love about church because it gets exhausting. It gets hard. And there's times, and I've even shared with EJ, like, I can't deal with petty things anymore because this isn't what I signed up for whenever I said yes to serving Jesus because it breaks my heart. And I'm emotional, y'all. It hurts. So when I see other people mad at each other, when I see other people fighting, when I see people who just like, I'm done. And these absolute statements, it breaks my heart into a million pieces. As Rainbow says, you broke my heart into a million pieces. And she's right. Because when you, when you feel empathy for others, it just hurts. And Jesus doesn't want us to discard each other. Instead, he wants to come meet us in this divisiveness and heal it and turn it around for something really good. So that's the call today. For these spiritual disciplines, there's two that we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on fasting. Because fasting is self-denial of something that's self-gratifying usually. Um, and I laughed because I told EJ whenever like, we were like giving out the sermons, like, fasting's really hard for me for my health. So I don't always, I can't always fast um, like a full food diet or anything like that. I'll pass out, so we don't want that to happen. Um, 
but there's other ways to fast. Things that really what you're doing is you're fasting things that deter you from spending time with God. So what does what could that look like? So fasting could be food. You could say, I'm going to only eat, you know, I'm going to fast a whole food diet. I'm only going to do juices. I'm only going to do this, whatever. Um, you can fast entertainment, TV, devices, video games, your tablet, your phone. Um, you could fast just desserts if you really have a sweet tooth like me. Um, you can fast anything as long as you're spending that time to say, God, come and meet me here. As I give these things up, come and reveal yourself to me. And that's what I'm going to ask you all, if you would all stand with me today, that we're going to do this week. We are going to choose a time to fast and pray. You, you're going to do it. We're not doing it corporately on the same day. Because everybody's lives are different. But I want you to spend that time with Jesus, genuinely. And, and humble your heart and say, God, please reveal to me if there's anything divisive in me that's harming your church. That's not representing you well to the people that I want to know you well. And if he reveals something to you, then the second thing that we're going to practice in our spiritual disciplines is confession. A lot of times we think that confession is just for a Catholic church because they practice this very well when they go and confess to the priest. We have access to God. But there's also something about confessing to somebody that you've been wrong. And it, it takes humility and it takes an attitude of I'm willing to change. It's one thing when God reveals it to you and you're like, yeah, that's probably true, God. Or mm -hmm. It's another thing to go and say, this is what God's been revealing to me and I need help to pray through this so that I can honor God in my worship. There was one time we were serving in a church and there was a lot of gossip going on. And this person doesn't know that that person knows and that person doesn't know that that person knows and that person doesn't know that the worship leader knows and the worship leader doesn't know that this. And it was like a hot mess. Just like when that happens, I'm like family meeting, right? Like we're just going to talk about this. But this was happening where it was on Facebook that the conversations that were happening on social media, I remember telling EJ, I said, I don't know how they could come and worship together when they argue so visibly in front of everybody. You know, there's, the, Jeremy taught me it's not a troll. What am I? I'm not a troll on Facebook. What am I? I'm a lurker. I didn't realize there was a difference. I'm learning. I'm a lurker. You know, with like when you're like, oh my gosh, did you see what she said to that person? Like, I'm not even involved in the conversation. I'm the meme of the person with the popcorn that's like, oh my gosh, did you see this? <laughs> and this was happening. And I just remember it was happening one evening, and I said to EJ, I don't know how they could come into a Sunday morning and worship together the way that they're speaking to each other publicly. They have no idea who else is involved in this conversation. They don't know all the lurkers that are hanging out in their news feed watching them. And it broke my heart. Because I think we've all been guilty of that where you don't realize. Once I realized that other people that don't comment, that don't whatever, I learned to clean up my Facebook real fast. Because I want my Facebook to glorify Jesus. And I want it as a Facebook memory because I'm horrible with diaries. So I get all the memories of my kids. You guys just get to be part of that. But this is what can cause divisiveness. And sure enough, one person did end up leaving the church during that time. Because they couldn't. They couldn't coexist with talking to each other like that. It's not healthy. And so I know I went long. I like don't even know the time right now. But I want to just ask God to meet us. Because if we're not growing in our faith, if we're just satisfied with salvation and not changing and allowing the Holy Spirit to change us, then we're just like sipping milk. We need some good meat to change us, right? To make us healthy. We need to grow up. I've heard people say, well, 
I'm just like this. Take it. This is just how God created me. Yes, he did, but he did create with the flesh and mind too, sweetheart. Like, you need to submit your flesh and who you are, your personality, your likes, your dislikes, everything at the feet of Jesus. Self-denial in a world of self-fulfillment is kind of an oxymoron right now. So one of the last things I want to leave you with is because when there's divisiveness, it means that there needs to be forgiveness, typically. Um, if you're having a hard time with forgiveness, I know I've struggled with forgiveness, and we've talked about forgiveness before, forgetting forgiveness, all those are different things. We're not saying jump right back into a relationship with somebody who broke your heart, but we're talking about healthy relationships, church relationships. And when EJ and I have walked through some church hurt many a times, the thing that got us through is we look at each other and say, they're going to be in heaven with us. We could either wait until eternity to fix it, or we can fix it now. And I heard this quote also recently. It said, Paul entered heaven to the cheers of those he persecuted. That's the gospel that we should live in the manner worthy of. That Paul, who persecuted Christians so harshly, martyred them. Ruthless. Paul wasn't like some dainty little soldier. He was ruthless. And if he could come to Jesus and find forgiveness, and that those who he persecuted, I don't really know what exactly how heaven looks like, but the image is pretty. To think that those are the ones to greet him, to cheer him on, to say, welcome, we're so glad you're here. I think we can do it too. Amen? So, Will you lead us in a song? And during this song, if you want to, if you have to leave, I get it. I'm probably way over time. But if you could take just a moment, the workers that are volunteering are going to be okay if you have kids too. Um, if you just want to spend a moment of prayer and to remember to be dependent on Jesus this week through fasting and praying and through confession. Um, so I'm going to actually pray, and then uh, you can dismiss as you feel led. But let's pray. Will you just lift your hands with me before the Lord? Jesus, we thank you that you are a God who does not hold our sin against us. That you show the perfection of what forgiveness and grace and mercy look like. And God, I pray that as we worship today, that our hearts and our minds will be opened to hear from you, Holy Spirit, of things that we need to change, the actions, pain that we've caused other people. God, I pray right now that you will reveal those to our hearts and that we will be bold enough to make it right, that we will be bold enough to shift and do an entire change of our actions. God, I pray that Genesis Church will not just be a church that's just content with status quo, but we will be a church that's alive and these living stones that honor God through our worship of our lives, that we will have relationships with other people in this church that are pleasing to you, that we can point people to you through our conflict, through our disagreements, through our lives, the fun that we have, the fellowship, the joys of being part of the church, God. And I pray, Lord, that you will just do a mighty work in our hearts, that you will change us that you will humble us. We want to be submitted to you so that we can be shining brightly for those to see. In Jesus' name, amen.
deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. Oh.